IRS can effectively use that large infusion of funding. The first panel consists of three former IRS commissioners, Fred Gober, John Koskinen, and Charles Rosati. The second includes three officials from independent government offices, the Congressional Budget Office, the Government Accountability Office, and the IRS's Taxpayer Advocate Services, who, and each of them who will be involved in the evaluation of the IRS's 10-year investment. First, some housekeeping rules. The event is being recorded and the recording will be posted online afterwards. Speaker biographies are available online. You can hide the captions or adjust the settings in the live transcription button. There will be time at the end of each panel for questions from the audience. All participants are muted, so you, type, you can type your questions or your comments into the Q&A box at any time. Please take one to two minutes to complete the survey at the end of this event. And lastly, engage with us online using hashtag live at urban. It's my pleasure now to introduce Catherine Rampell, who will moderate the first panel. Catherine is an opinion columnist at the Washington Post. She frequently covers economics, public policy, immigration, and politics, with special emphasis on data-driven journalism. She's also an economic and political commentator for CNN, a special correspondent for the PBS NewsHour, and a contributor to Marketplace. Before joining the Post, she wrote about economics and theater for the New York Times. Catherine, I turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Janet. And thank you so much to everyone for joining us today. I am delighted to welcome our esteemed panelists who will discuss some of the challenges that IRS has faced over the years, as well as the opportunities that the agency has now to implement solutions. You all should have the full biographies of our speakers and panelists, but just to give you a brief rundown, we are joined by Fred Goldberg, who had multiple IRS and Treasury leadership roles during the 80s and 90s, including IRS Chief Counsel, IRS Commissioner, and Assistant Secretary of the Treasury for Tax Policy. He was subsequently a tax partner at Skadden Arps until 2017 and has been there as an of counsel. Um, we also have Charles Rosati, who served as IRS Commissioner from 1997 to 2002. He is a founder and director of Shrink the Tax Gap, which is, I'm sure, a, a concept we will discuss today, uh, and currently is a senior advisor focused primarily on investments in the fields of IT and business services. Prior work includes public and private sector leadership roles, including uh, co-founding American Management Systems. And then finally, John Koskinen, who served as IRS Commissioner from 2013 through 2017. He is now retired. Uh, his previous work includes various positions at Freddie Mac, the United States Soccer Foundation, OMB, as well as the local DC government. So thank you so much to all of our panelists once again. Um, Commissioner Koskinen, I wanted to start with you. All of you were put through the ringer by lawmakers at one point or another, probably multiple points. My memories of your grilling are probably freshest. I'm wondering, what advice would you give to Danny Werfel, the nominee, the recently announced nominee for IRS commissioner, as he starts to embark um, on this vetting process? Well, obviously, as uh, has been noted, the $80 billion is a unique experience for the IRS over the last 10 or 12 years of budget cutting. I think my basic advice to Danny would be to have a, as clear an idea as possible <clears throat> of the various ways the money is going to be spent with measures, and then to spend a lot of time being transparent and in consultation with the Congress, that he needs to bring them along on the journey so that they understand how the money is being spent and what the public is getting in response to that, both in terms of improved taxpayer service, uh, improved information technology and uh, tax collection. But it'll be the taxpayer service element of it that I think the Congress and the public are gonna be most interested in. And I think uh, as long as Danny is transparent about what the goals are and that are realistic and then reports against them, I think he'll do fine. Um, Commissioner Goldberg, is $80 billion too much too little? Was it allocated uh, in, in the appropriate way? I mean, about half, over the half the funds were allocated to enforcement, I think 30% to operations management, 4% for customer service. Is that the right breakdown 
was the emphasis both in dollars and in rhetoric on enforcement rather than customer service, um, you know, perhaps a mistake given that it has attracted a lot of um, uh, divisiveness to say the least and, and threats to the persistence of this funding stream. Thanks, Catherine. To, to take your two questions separately, what's important to keep in mind is this is over a 10 year period. Uh, starting from the current base funding, it's five or 6% increase a year. I believe that that is manageable and usable properly. In terms of the allocation, uh, We use the words enforcement and we use the word service. The way to think about enforcement is it is a means, it is not an end. It is a means to compliance. And when you think about much of what the service does, more than 70% are correspondence audits. Well, that is a process where something comes to a taxpayer, the taxpayer has to deal with it, reach out to the IRS. Taxpayer should have his phones answered, her phones answered, his phones answered. The interaction should be smooth, it should be seamless, and it should lead to prompt resolution. Now, some folks think about that as service, as probably accounted for, that is within the compliance bucket. There is, unfortunately, and CBO and everybody else lives with it, the current system does not score what is classically referred to as service. Service has as much of an impact on improved compliance, be more so than anything else that happens. So I believe properly allocated and properly accounted for, the service can make this work. The political rhetoric, hopefully that's in the rear view mirror, because this is all about making it right for everybody. So do you think that they have the, that the agency has the flexibility it needs then to deploy the dollars yes, in the I most effective they sense? They do have flexibility. One of the things that was not in the legislation but requested was additional flexibility in contracting and hiring. I believe OPM has the authority to make that work well. And the point is that this is doable. I believe it's going to happen. And I believe the administration has the flexibility. And part of it goes back to John's point. If the commissioner is candid, open, and brings the Congress along on the journey, I think this is all going to work out. Commissioner Rosati, what about you? Do you think that this is the right allocation of funds? Would you like to have seen it divvied yeah. up differently? Well, I, I think that the, that the I really sign on to the point that uh, that Fred was making. Uh, it's called service and enforcement, but from the taxpayer's point of view, a lot of what frustrates taxpayers, in fact, what key, the biggest part that frustrates taxpayers are things that happen under, that would be funded under the enforcement chain. He was talking about correspondence audits, the whole collection thing. If you send in a return and you have some error or the, maybe the IRS has an error and they send you a notice that says you didn't pay what you're supposed to, uh, you then have to call them up or correspond or in some way communicate and fix that whole thing. That, if it was, if it was uh, done from one of those notices, is funded by enforcement, even though from the taxpayer's point of view, it's really service, uh, you know, in, in the sense that you need to, to interact with the taxpayer, I mean, excuse me, with the IRS in order to resolve that problem. And by the way, there's 175 million notices issued per year. Almost all of them are in some form of an enforcement chain. Every one of those has to be responded to and resolved you know, by the taxpayer and the IRS. And almost all of those are funded by the enforcement appropriation. So you know, the accounting of, for these appropriations um, you know, has to be done. But I think the bottom line is what Fred said. The IRS has plenty of flexibility to do what it needs to do to make sure the taxpayers are served properly. I might just uh, chime in a little that one other area of great flexibility is what people don't understand often is that a lot of the improvements in taxpayer service really depend upon technology. So a significant amount of the funding 
for modernization and information technology is going to make life easier for taxpayers. The goal when I was there was to try to get as many taxpayers off the phone as possible and allow them to interact with the IRS online. So over 90% of taxpayers now file online. Uh, you can pay online. You can track your re refund online. And the goal is you ought to be able to do everything online, communicate, respond to those notices that Fred and Charles have talked about. And all of that to happen is out of the uh, IT budget, not necessarily out of the uh, service budget, but it makes a huge difference for service. Um, one of the um, one of the concerns that I frequent, frequently hear from people, who, readers who write to me when I've written about how this money will be deployed, is that they are concerned that more enforcement money means that they, in particular, are more likely to come under audit, even if they are honest. Um, and Commissioner Rosati, you've talked about the need not for more audits, but for better targeted audits, basically yeah. to make uh, it's less likely that mm -hmm. honest taxpayers are drawn into the dragnet, if you will, and yeah. that those who are not compliant are more likely to be flagged for audit. One proposal that I know that you were um, a proponent of in the past few years involved doing more financial reporting requirements, which obviously hasn't happened. But what else could be done, in your view, maybe with existing information that's already reported to the agency or different kinds of technology to make... Yeah the auditing process um, better targeted to, to allay those fears of honest taxpayers? Well, let me say, uh, Catherine, that your readers and you summarizing your readers' comments are on to one of the most important points there is about this whole program, which is that simply increase, I know people think of auditing and you know there's been talk about vast increases in auditing. The, the, the amount of auditing the IRS does, if you doubled it, wouldn't even make a dent in the tax gap. What really matters is use of data to find the, the places where there really is underreporting of income or uh, or noncompliance, let's say. And the IRS, when it uses data effectively, is very, very effective and very efficient. Um, and it, is, it does that for, traditionally for a long time in doing what's called a matching program. Well, if you underreport you know, your, your, your dividend, you know, you can match it up against what the bank says and they'll tell you you, you missed something. Um, small amounts usually. Um, and what is really the opportunity is to go much, much further along that road in using the data that the IRS has. I mean, just to tell you how much data the IRS has and also how little it's using, the IRS receives almost 2 billion information reports every year from third parties like payers and banks that report $18 trillion, that's trillion dollars of income. The IRS, you know, that is information that the IRS has that it can use to determine who may or may not be underreporting, and then it can follow up efficiently. Uh, unfortunately, and this is largely due to you know, lack of funding and lack of technology investment is uh, the IRS only uses a tiny, tiny fraction of that. I'll give you an ex a very just simple example. There's over $1.2 trillion of income that comes in from what are called pass-through businesses like partnerships and, and S corporations that is supposed to be reported on individual returns. The, the business doesn't pay any tax. The individual is supposed to pay it. That comes in on a report called a K-1 of which there's, uh, I think it's uh, 4 million or so of those that come in. The IRS doesn't have any automated system to use any of that. It can use it if there's an audit that comes up, but it doesn't have any systematic way. And I could go on and on. There's another new um, report that the Congress uh, in, you know, authorized greater reporting on what's called the 1099K that deals with certain kinds of payments of things like if you have short-term rental income from like Airbnb, and all kinds of other things like that. That is a, an enormous untapped opportunity. On the other side to it, if the IRS does not do that, it, it will result in, I think, unfortunately, too many audits that are not productive. At the present time, if you look at high income audits, the, the ones that are the most important, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent of those audits are reported by the IRS itself to be what's called no change audits, which means that they audited, but they didn't find anything. There was, there was no need to do that audit. It was just a poor allocation. It wasn't deliberate, but they just didn't have good numbers to pick it. And that's actually an understatement because from our experience, you know, personally, we know that it would be much larger if you just looked, that number would be even worse if you just looked at audits that result in very small uh, changes, but not material. So the IRS today is stuck 
with you know older methods of uh, doing compliance with which results in a large significant fraction of audits that don't need to be done and which does not make use of a lot of data that it already has that it could use so that's really where the opportunity comes it doesn't mean that there won't have to be audits and there has been a decline in audits and you know john's you know indicated in some of his writings about how far it's down it's gone of course you do need audits but just increasing auditing is not going to solve the problem and i'll finally conclude with one statistic if you took the total amount of money that the IRS currently you know, gets back from all of the audits it does on everything per year, it's about $10.5 billion a year, which is less than 2% of the total tax gap. If you doubled it, if you doubled that immediately with the funding that the IRS has, which they couldn't do, of course, but if you did, that would still only make a minor dent in the tax gap. It wouldn't be, even be as much as CBO estimated they would get. So it's clear, it's absolutely clear that if the IRS wants to do what is not only in the best interest of the taxpayers, but also in the best interest of shrinking the tax gap, which is our moniker, it has to use data and technology. That is the only way that can happen. It doesn't mean there won't be any auditing, but the auditing has to be leveraged by better use of technology. And this is going to take some time, which is why the long-term nature of the funding is very important. Can't be done immediately. Uh, Commissioner Koskinen, so uh, picking up on that question about targeting of audits, the, this administration has said that it will be targeting very wealthy individuals and large businesses and corporations um, for its increased enforcement activity. And Secretary Yellen has also directed the IRS to not use additional funding for audits of people with less than $400,000 uh, relative to recent historic and or historical levels. Is that a realistic restriction? Um, how would that be implemented since the IRS won't know someone's real income without the audit? How can this actually be done? Because this is another question that I hear a lot of skepticism about from taxpayers. Right. Well, first, as a general matter, let me, uh, you know, following up on Charles, <clears throat> again, reassure your readers, uh, the IRS has no real interest in people who are honest taxpayers. Uh, you may get into an audit on occasion. But the IRS does keep track of the no change rate because it recognizes if there's no change, or as Charles said, even a minor change, that's really a waste of the taxpayer's time and a waste of the IRS's time. So in the context, as I noted, the audit rate overall has dropped by over 50% across the board. And that's people under 400,000, rich people, everybody else, just because there are eight to 10,000 fewer revenue agents than there were 10 or 12 years ago. So what uh, Secretary Yellen has said and the administration has said is that there won't be an increase in the rate of audits for people under 400,000 above what the historic rate is. So there will be some increase to get back to where we were 10 or 12 years ago in the normal course of the audits. But I think the critical point is Charles' point, which is if you can improve the technology and do better data analytics, you'll be better across the board. Uh, as I say, the IRS goal is to find people who are pushing the envelope or not filing at all, or certainly just cheating on their taxes. I used to say that when you cut the IRS budget, it was really a tax cut for tax cheats, because they're the ones who understand that their chances of being audited went down significantly. So back to your honest taxpayer, uh, the goal is not to audit them. The IRS recognizes there's nothing to be gained by wasting the taxpayer's time or their time. And the goal would be to see if uh, with the funding for information technology, if over time you couldn't actually get better data analytics, better use of artificial intelligence, uh, so that you could do things like audit large partnerships. What most people don't realize is we think of partnerships as eight or 10 lawyers or doctors buying an office building. Uh, today, many of these partnerships have thousands of partners and some of those partners are partnerships of thousands of partners. And, and the ability of the IRS thus far has been very limited to be able to analyze with data those partnership returns. They're huge. And so basically a lot of partnerships just aren't audited at all. And that's where with better data analytics, uh, you have a real opportunity to generate at least what the CBO said, if not more over 10 years. Catherine, if I could just amplify what, what John have said is, one, I do not I do not think getting audit coverage for low and lower middle income individuals and businesses back to where they were 
is necessary and perhaps not even appropriate. But when you get to large partnership, this is John's point, is there is sort of the raw underreporting. But when you're talking large, complex partnerships, when you're talking sort of the next tier of large businesses, high net worth individuals, there's a lot of things that happen in the structuring, complex partnership structures, offshore structures. And part of it is, and part of the critical importance for data and research is understanding these structures. And at least I think in the experience of folks such as myself who live in those kinds of worlds, agents simply are not equipped at all to understand what the structures are and what the quote techniques are to reduce taxes. Well, fine, there are techniques that are permitted by statute, but there are folks who clearly cross the boundary. And so I think, I agree it is data, technology, data. I think research is also important. And I think that when underreported income is the function or the result of a particular structure, you need to understand that too and decide whether that's okay under current law. Well, if it's okay under current law, but you don't like the answer, go change the law. Don't mess. Don't, don't try to climb the mountain if you can't climb the mountain under existing law. But the key is technology, data, research. This is not about hiring as many revenue officers and agents as you can to go chase people. That will be an utter and complete failure. And I think the IRS understands that. And I think Treasury understands that. So Commissioner Goldberg, uh, you just touched on something that I also want to ask you about, which is that I know I've been presenting a lot of these questions in the form of honest taxpayers versus not so honest taxpayers. But the tax code is notoriously complicated. A lot of these arrangements are complex and there are gray areas that lead to disputes between taxpayers and the IRS. Is more money being allocated for compliance and enforcement sufficient without tax simplification? Uh, where would you begin if the answer is no? Well, that's been the holy grail for 40 years, but, and it's not moving in that direction. But I, I think part of this is we think of the IRS and then we think of whoever is working at the IRS. You've got the chief counsel's office and you've got treasury tax policy. And, and where the system I believe has been eroding in certain respects and continues to erode is that when folks say the only way to deal with compliance is audits, that's a mistake. Treasury does policy. The chief counsel's office supports treasury. The chief counsel supports the commissioner in pursuing whatever mission he or she believes should be pursued. And those are also tools and important tools of improving compliance. The notion of making tax policy through the courts, which I believe is an increasing trend, is another mistake. Well, Treasury got a giant increase in funding for the Office of Tax Policy to do this thing. And this is an integrated effort. It is not hire more agents to audit more folks, whether they're rich folks, poor folks, anywhere in between. That's not going to work. Yes, I would say prefer a simplified system. <laughs> it was a sort of a rhetorical question. Um, yes, I, I don't. I don't know if, if uh, either of the other commissioners want to, to weigh in on that question about, you know, to what extent can additional resources overcome the fact that there is, I don't know, that, that there's complexity in the law and that the agency yeah. seems like it's always going well, to be outgunned. Well, it is, it is true. When I took tax policy or tax law in law school, you know, low those many years ago, 
the tax code was about this high and the regulations were about that high. I mean, it was, they were all on a single volume. The tax code was a volume and the regulations were a volume. Now you have literally thousands of pages of regulations to go along with the thousands of pages of law. And what people don't understand is the IRS not only enforces law, the IRS is a social welfare agency these days. It issues every year over $100 billion of refunds and tax credits beyond the stimulus payments that were one-time events over the last two or three years. So in addition to the law being more complex, the IRS, even with the Congress always grumbling and complaining about it, continues to get more responsibilities and things that don't look like uh, tax law enforcement. They really are uh, welfare programs, which are everybody loves the earned income tax credit. It was Ronald Reagan's fa most favorite um, welfare program, I'm told. Uh, so it is, uh, you're exactly right. Uh, even back uh, years ago, it was clear that the best thing for taxpayers would be tax simplification. Uh, and the thing that would make people happier, if you could be happy, by paying your taxes is if it didn't take you hours and hours and thousands of dollars and all sorts of experts you can't understand trying to tell you uh, how to do it. Uh, I don't hold up a lot of hope. Uh, there hasn't been a major move in Congress to simplify the tax code for some time. But your point's well taken. I mean, a lot of what we're talking about is responsive to the complexity that's out there. And Fred's right. The answer isn't more regulations. The answer is, couldn't we get rid of some of this stuff or couldn't we simplify uh, the legislation underlying it? Yeah, the only comment I'll make is because uh, these, my colleagues here are lawyers and I'm not, uh, but uh, um, you know, I think that the fact that there is complexity and I'm going to say that when you run the IRS, you have to take the tax code the way it is because if you wait till it's simplified, you're not gonna do your job. And what that means in today's context where you have increasing, not decreasing complexity, as well as new programs, you know, being loaded on, it only improves, increases the importance of the two things we've already been talking about. One is providing reasonable service to people that may may have a problem of whatever sort of their own making or the IRS's problem. It's just not reasonable to expect people to comply and not provide them the assistance they need to do that efficiently. I mean, it's bad enough asking them to do that and then making it harder to interact with the IRS. So that has got to be a top prayer. The other thing is on this compliance thing, you, you simply can't with this complexity do auditing as a solution to, to compliance alone. I mean, because trying to just say, okay, I'm going to hand some revenue agent a tax return and, and you know, I'm going to use some kind of magic to hand them a tax return. And then from then on, it's up to them is inevitably going to result in what we have now, which is very inefficient uh, use of enforcement resources. A lot of non, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, you know, no change audits and a lot of frustration on the taxpayers. So if we're going to have this kind of a tax code, which we're going to have some degree for a while, We've got to find better ways to help taxpayers cope with it and help the IRS cope with it through the use of the data and the technology that's available today. Uh, in some ways, yep. complexity is asymmetric in that for very large, complex enterprises that are themselves complex, the complexity can be awful, miserable, expensive, painful, but it also can be a playground. When you're talking about low income, middle income individuals and small businesses, complexity is an unmitigated disaster. And so if you, if you think about it that way, part of the question is whether treasury can use its existing authorities to just get off the backs of some of these lower income folks and these small businesses. I believe they have the power to do that it is a totally different context for the reason Charles and John are saying. When you get when you get to the folks that the IRS and Treasury say they're going to be paying attention to, and that one cuts both ways. Um, so, Commissioner Rosati, there have been previous times when Congress appropriated money for modernization, for digitization, for other kinds of upgrades. Uh, I think the IRS business system modernization is now decades in progress. My question is, what's different about this time? Um, is it just the scale of the funding that makes you more optimistic that there will be the upgrades that are necessary? Is it the relative 
reliability of the funding? Are there other management lessons in addition um, to the, the amount of dollars um, that could be learned from prior attempts at modernization that you think would make this round more successful? Yeah. So I, I, that's a great question. And when I talk to people, that's one of the questions I get, you know, when I'm talking to my friends about it. And so it's, it's a very good question. But let me answer it by two ways. One is by at least partially disagreeing with the premise, I think the implied premise, which is that past success, uh, efforts have been unsuccessful, because I don't think that's true, at least not as true as people think. And then I'll get to why people do mostly think that way. So on the question of whether they've been successful, um, the fact of the matter is that if you look at the IRS today, um, there have been massive improvements in the way that it uses technology that if it hadn't happened, you know, the IRS would have collapsed during the pandemic, as example. The best the couple of examples I could say that are obvious are the fact that over 90% of returns are filed electronically up from practically none when I was commissioner. Without that, you would have not functioned. Secondly, there's uh, probably five to 600 million interactions a year of taxpayers getting information from websites uh, that, uh, that didn't exist some years ago, which if you didn't have that, you know, also you wouldn't have been able to function. And then on top of that, there's more specific things that uh, have been noted, for example, on refund screening for false refunds and, and uh, identity theft. The IRS has been quite successful with that, with tech, using modern, very modern technology, actually. The GAO has recognized that. And, as a res and there's other things I could cite, but I think a, a key point is that GAO, which keeps a list of the highest risk agencies in, in managing technology, took the IRS off that list about eight years ago, or I think it was seven or eight years ago. So it's not, although the perception is certainly accurate that it's been a failure, it hasn't been a failure. What is true is that it's been constrained, very, very constrained by funding. How much? So I'll give you one data point. This year, the JP Morgan Bank is going to spend $12 billion on technology, 12 billion. That's about the same as the entire IRS budget, not the technology budget, the entire IRS budget. And JP Morgan's a big, organization, but it doesn't have as many customers as the IRS has taxpayers. So that just gives you a sense of the scale. But it's also the fact that where the IRS has had funding, it's been uneven. Uh, and John Koskinen was the experience. I mean, you could have a, a technology project start and then it ends at the fiscal year and the next year it doesn't get funded until the middle of the year. It's almost impossible. To, it's very, very difficult to manage any kind of technology project with that kind of unevenness. So that's that's why I'm saying I don't really agree with the premise of your question in, in, in many cases. However, there is that perception and uh, that, oh, the IRS has failed in its modernization. I think that is, that is fed, not that there haven't been specific failures, but the bigger point is it's been fed by even the IRS itself and by Treasury and others that constantly cite the fact that the IRS depends on these old so-called master files the so-called COBOL master files that do the tax processing system, uh, which are very old. And yes, they are. And it's very, very slow to replace those. And over time, they have to be replaced. But guess what? Every large organization I know of, and that would include all the banks, some of which I've been on the board of, have these old legacy systems. Every business has them. Um, and they have to be replaced very slowly because you can't do them quickly. Uh, the IRS is older, maybe, and worse, but it has that basic issue. But that does, did not stop the IRS from doing the things I cited, nor does it have to stop them in the future, especially if they get more, um, more funding. So what's the solution? The solution is that the replacement of the old legacy systems does have to be done, and it does have to be done slowly because it can't be done quickly. You embed the whole tax code in it. Uh, and that has to go on in the background. But that does not have to, if you have proper funding, that does not have to impede more rapid progress on things that affect taxpayers that can improve service, like, like these self-service accounts. The IRS is, is started on that journey, even with things like self-service installment agreements, but it can go much faster with the additional funding. One thing I would just add, uh, I support everything Charles said is, <clears throat> A key part of the 10 year funding uh, for IT is that it's 10 years. Uh, as Charles noted, episodically, having it, because most of the work is done by contractors, and if you can only contract for a year, and sometimes with a continuing resolution, you don't even know what your budget is until four or five months into the year. And then at the end of the year, you have no idea what your money for the next year is. One year 
the modernization budget while I was there was cut by 50% at the last minute, uh, which threw everything into chaos. So having the money over a longer period of time, so you not only can plan for the 10 years uh, with in incremental modules that we've done to improve it, but being able to contract uh, in, that co in that context is a lot better and more efficient than the annual stop and start, stop and start. Uh, do we have the money for next year? And now we have to do the contract or extend it again. So I think that 10 years has a significant positive impact on the ability of the IRS to do all the things Charles has been talking about. Let, let me just add one last point, uh, Catherine, which is that I didn't get to, are there lessons? Yes, the lessons in addition to the funding and the other things I've said is that um, very strong leadership from the top is necessary. And it isn't te necessarily technology leadership, it is technology leadership, but it's really the whole leadership of the agency because there are so many important cross-cutting decisions that have to be made about how you allocate money for technology and how you reduce risk. And I could go on and on, but the leadership has to be engaged in the, in the issue of applying technology to improve the way the IRS works. It's not something that you can delegate just to some bunch of IT people. Catherine, part of this to me is storytelling, like what's really going on. And just picking up on the two points that Charles, points Charles made and John made, Real things are happening. There's a guy named Darren Guillot, who's head of collection with the support of the commissioner, who's a Reddick with the support of the tech folks, has put in place a system on collections where you can call, these, this is call and get general questions answered. That has resulted in a 70% and taxpayers can choose. I want to get this machine to answer my question or the, some person. It's reduced phone calls to live people by 70%. The bigger deal is you can call, if you owe the IRS $23,000, you can call a number. It's always going to be answered. You get to set the terms of your installment agreement up to six years. And if life happens and you want to change that, pay more fast, you know, defer more payments, you can do that 100% of the time. These are real, real things. Uh, Aaron, uh, the taxpayer advocate who's on your next panel, had a couple of very interesting blogs about the 70% plus of correspondence audits. There is something called taxpayer digit Digital communications, leave it to the IRS to have a TDC initial for it. This permits email interactions with a single person who's responsible for your case. They're going to be launching something called Document Upload Tool, DUT. And Aaron's written about this. What this does in these correspondence audits, by definition, they're hand handled by passing things back and forth. This allows the taxpayer to upload documents on a cell phone or a computer and get it to the IRS. These are really big deals. CI is the head of the pack in using technology to materially improve how you develop and how you identify criminal cases, which improves compliance because if they're out there doing their job right, it has an impact. All of these things are happening now. So, and they've been happening before the $80 billion. The point is the IRS has incredibly talented folks who know how to do this. But as John says, it's been feast or famine every year. And as Charles says, there's not enough time to plan how to do this. Taking the collections technology can be applied to taxpayer assistance. It can be applied to these kinds of audits. But there are a couple of lessons here. One, these kinds of initiatives don't all succeed. Progress and risk are married, joined at the hip. So not all of this is going to work. And none of it is going to be perfect out of the box it's gonna to need to improve. And I think one of the big challenges that all of us have is 
support these efforts to do this differently. But it, they're not all going to work. And it goes, I think you're like the best there is, Catherine, but it goes to the press in part. How do you deal with the inevitable mistakes? It goes back to John's point. It is candor. This is what we're going to try to do. And if it doesn't work, raise your hand and say it didn't work. And the oversight function, Congress is complicated, but at least in my view, GAO and CBO are gems because they do it fair and balanced. But that's what's going to happen over the next 10 years. I'm off my podium, I'll shut up, but it's a big deal. Well, one thing that I've heard, I think all of you mentioned so far, is the importance of the reliability of this 10-year funding that you can make 10-year, you can make long-term contracts, you don't have to worry about the whims of appropriators from year to year. But one concern that some people have raised is that Congress didn't actually construct any guardrails between the $80 billion multi-year funding boost and the regular annual, annual appropriations. So what is to prevent appropriators from cutting back on the annual uh, budgets and essentially force IRS to make up the difference with the funds. I mean, how how should the agency think about those kinds of risks, um, given that this was supposed to, this, this funding uh, stream was supposed to be reliable, but there is still some political risk attached to it? There always is, <clears throat> but I think it goes back to what we've been talking about in terms of having Congress come along with the journey. What the Congress has to understand is if they cut it back, what are they losing? And it's not, you know, you can't be talking about I got $80 billion foot run. Uh, in some ways, it's Fred's point. There are improvements going on and improvements that could happen in the next 6, 12, 18, 24 months in the module. You don't want projects that, don't, that take five years to get done. And people have to know about them. They have to expect them. Um, they have to be told about them when they're accomplished. And so when you're <clears throat> saying, I'm going to cut back your 12 or $13 billion dollar budget by 5 billion and you can take it out of the 80 and we'll just winnow away the 80. People, the Congress has to understand the impact on their constituents. As I said, there's no Democratic or Republican way to run the IRS. You're actually trying to make it efficient and effective. And the people affected when it doesn't work well are Republicans as well as Democrats and independents. They are the citizens and taxpayers of the country and they're everybody's constituents. And so I think oftentimes um, Congress anxious to cut the IRS don't understand that while they may be helping tax sheets, what they're doing is making life much more difficult for their constituents or missing great opportunities for their constituents to have a better experience with the IRS. For a lot of people, their only interaction with the government is when they file their taxes. And if Congress interferes with the ability to make that relationship get better, uh, the Congress needs to understand it and their constituents need to understand that. Are there things that you think um... Uh, Commissioner Costin, that, that IRS can get done quickly to show progress to taxpayers and, and build more support for sustaining this funding and potentially insulate the agency against, um, you know, calls for more future funding well, cuts? Because these are long-term <laughs> projects. Are there things in the near yeah. term that would build more allies? Well, the first thing you can do, and it's not the rocket scientists, is they're already doing is hire more people to answer the phones. The fact that only 11% of calls went through last year obviously is uh, uh, abysmal and terrible for taxpayers, terrible for the poor people who are the IRS who finally have somebody on the phone who's been waiting uh, for three hours or called 12 times to get through. So simply having more people to answer the phones is gonna make the taxpayer service much better. And that funding is coming right out of the, it's part of taxpayer service coming out of these uh, dollars. But Fred had a number of very good examples that to the extent <clears throat> that you can do individual projects like that. Uh, and Charles is right, we spend a lot of time improving uh, refund fraud issues. There are probably 800,000 taxpayers a year who no longer have their returns frozen because somebody else filed a return before them. The technology and the work has been done so that if somebody, <clears throat> it looks like they're filing your return, it's stopped. And they, the IRS contacts you and says, is that your return? So I think, again, it goes back to transparency, but I think there are a significant number of incremental steps that the taxpayer will find, find, find make life much easier for them. And I love the story about being able to upload documents rather than mailing them. I hope they get through. 
that are there. But the Congress needs to see those, needs to understand the impact of them, and needs to understand that, as Fred said, not everything is going to work. But when they work, they're wonderful steps forward, and they're made possible by the 80 billion. But it still is true. There's nothing to keep appropriators from saying, well, let's just cut their budget and spend the money somewhere else, and they can take it out of the 80 billion. And if they do that very often, they'll un undermine the ability of the IRS to improve service and, and, and undermine the ability to deal with uh, closing some of the tax gap. So let me just say that I not only all agree with that, but I'll pinpoint it this way, that this is why it's so important for the Congress to uh, act on, uh, uh, you know, a, a hearing and, a, and a, a confirmation of the new commissioner, because really the commissioner is the person who has to do two things that along these lines. One is set the priorities internally so that they are, um, th there's a, hundreds of things that the IRS could be doing, you know, and no matter how much money you have, you can't do them all. So setting the priorities that will have the, that can be done with reasonable risk and will have the impact is an internal job. But then externally, as Fred has said, building the relationships with Congress and communicating that this is what's going to happen uh, over the next six months, the next year, and, 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 and bringing that message home, those stories home, so that the Congress can, and, and the public actually, uh, can appreciate what, what progress is being made. So really there's no substitute for a confirmed commissioner to do those two things. We have an audience question that's uh, relevant to this discussion, which is how can the IRS improve public perception and trust in the agency, especially in an age of misinformation and conspiracy? How can the average taxpayer better understand why giving the IRS $80 billion is necessary and important to them? Is there anything any of you want to add to address that question? Well, I think uh, Fred touched on it. It's really the, <clears throat> the stories, the information sharing. Uh, a lot of times, you know, most people, and I remember my experience a lot in the Congress, you mention information technology and their eyes glaze over and, you know, it's all disappears. And so what you need to do for the public as well as the Congress is have people understand <clears throat> this is what we're trying to do and this is how it's getting better. And remind them of all the changes that have already been done. 90% uh, of taxpayers filing online, as Charles said, is stunning. Uh, and there used to be 10 processing centers that processed, you know, 90% of the paper returns, millions of them, you know, 100 million of them. There, we're now down to headed toward two of those. And for taxpayers, it's just a lot easier uh, to have it happen that way. So I do think that there will always be the stories. And there are a lot of people in Congress who are delighted to talk about the IRS is coming after you with AR-15s. But what needs to be happen is you need to have people understand this the good things that are going on. I used to travel around the country and see IRS employees. And I said, you know, I understand that if people ask you, where do you work? You say the government. And then they say, where in the government do you work? And you say, well, I work in the treasury department. And then they say, where in the treasury do you work? Well, I work in the IRS. And I said, no, we had at that time 100,000 people. I said, we need 100,000 ambassadors for the Internal Revenue Service. All of you are on school boards, your home room parents, you are soccer coaches, you're out in the community and people know you and respect you. And if they understand, well, gee, Mary or Joe work for the IRS and they're good people, maybe the agency is staffed by really good people. Uh, so it was easy for me to say we had to have those 100,000 ambassadors. But my bet is a lot of people don't know that their neighbors, friends, colleagues actually work for the Internal Revenue Service. And that's going to be a big part of the story. Catherine, it, is a big it is a very big job for the commissioner, though. I think all of us I mean, I know just for myself, I traveled almost every week out to different parts of the country talking to local people and, and trying to, you know, uh, and I, I will say there's a lot of other constituencies that can help with this. You have uh, many taxpayers use practitioners. I mean, I'd say what 70% or 60% probably use uh, some sort of a practitioner to help them file um, the lawyers, the accountants. Um, you know, many different uh, uh, people like that are, are involved with the IRS. They can be helpful if they are, if you work with them and make them partners. Catherine, there's a whole, GAO did a very interesting report on this, this kind of thing with this group of taxpayers several years ago. And part of this is the IRS open on the windows, open on the doors, let the drawbridge down because the accounting profession is a really big deal for the reason Charles is saying. These programs they're launching, if you were a private sector business, obviously sales tell you something, 
but private sector businesses ask their customers, how's it going? That's done independently. The IRS can do all of that. I believe they are starting to do it. I believe the, some of the new leadership, I believe the new commissioner says, we're, this is a partnership deal. We're all doing this together. And the proof that it's working is what the people say. Uh, one I thing say, that commissioner says. One thing that I think has been implicit in some of uh, all three of your comments recently is the importance of having the right talent at the agency, um, whether as ambassadors to the world or otherwise. And I, I'm wondering if any of you want to talk about the challenges of um, of attracting um, auditors and tax lawyers who can go toe to toe with those in the private sector or competing with private firms for programmers and experts in AI. How challenging is it to hire people given the wages that the agency pays as well as some of the public perceptions of what it means to be the tax man? Um, you know, if you don't know one from your local school board or you know, otherwise see them as human. Um, do any of you wanna talk a little, maybe, I don't know if Commissioner Koskinen, since you were most recently um, helmed well, it, it, it clearly is a challenge. Um, but I was surprised when I was there, we, were, we lost 20,000 employees while I was there over the four years. So we didn't hire a lot of people, but occasionally we would reach out and have an opening uh, for assistance or something. And at one point we were gonna hire 500. And I was delighted and gratified by the number of applicants we had. Uh, now these were not technical positions, but I think even for technologists, there are a lot of people who are interested in public service and interested in understand the mission of the IRS, the fact that it touches virtually every American family. And so uh, I think that, especially in cybersecurity and in the high technology areas where everybody, every company and everybody's out there trying to find the best people they can, uh, you can't underestimate the challenge. My hope is that at some point, the streamlined critical pay will be reinstalled uh, so that the IRS can hire people quickly rather than saying, you're terrific, wait for three or four months and we'll get back to you and can pay incrementally more than the highest government salary just to show the value that's attached to those technology positions. Uh, but ultimately, uh, the agency itself is staffed with people who joined it because they believed in both public service and the mission of the agency. And I continue to be uh, pleased and delighted, especially with younger people who are committed to public service and wanna make a contribution. And I, my pitch, pitch, pitch always was as commissioner, you want to make a contribution and see real change, the IRS is going to be a great place for you. Yeah. I mean, I think that I had the same experience when in the, in the one year that we had actually hiring authority, uh, that we were able to attract very qualified people. But you have to sell the mission. I mean, I use the analogy to the military. Why do people join the military? They don't get paid a lot. They have a very demanding situation. They get deployed. I mean, they have personal risk, could be deployed in, in very dangerous places. Um, and they join, you know, in, in large part because of the mission uh, and the commitment. And I think that absolutely, from my experience, that is uh, possible at the IRS. Um, and I think the fact that the Congress has provided some funding long term shows support for that mission. Uh, now, the commissioner and his team is going to have to convey that to people and, and get that across and provide the right support. So it has to be done in the right way. It's not automatic, but the, the opportunity is there. Um, yes, pay is important and you have to be reasonable in your pay. I mean, that's why some of the authorities are important, but nobody's going to join either the IRS or the military to get the highest pay. They have to get an adequate pay, but they have to believe in the mission. And I believe that is entirely possible to do actually from my own practical experience during some of the period when I was at the IRS, when I did have some hiring authority. I, I agree with, with, with what both John and Charles are saying, but there's another dimension to this, particularly on the technology side, is contracting out and bringing, and that, that's done all, Charles, you know, that is done frequently. There are folks in the private sector who know how to do this, uh, have done this stuff, and that avoids the, the yeah. issues at internal hiring trouble. Well, I mean, on technology, you know, this is a field that I've been in my whole, most of my life. 
almost the entire federal government does almost all of its technology development through contract. There's, you know, th that doesn't mean you don't need internal people because you do. You need the leadership and you need a, a cadre. But as far as the, the large portion of the work, um, it's, it's, it's almost always done by contract. And that's true in the private sector too. Most private sector companies do a lot of their technology work by contract. That's just the, the most efficient way to do it. So, um, you know, that's another option that you have. Um, getting back to the question of budgeting, I mean, we've been talking a lot about outlays. I'm wondering, one of the big debates um, that has been held over this infusion of money into the agency has been, what will the payoff be? Um, and there's been some debate about how long it would actually take to realize some of that additional enforcement revenue, um, given how long it takes to hire up, to revamp some of these processes, invest in new technologies, et cetera. Do any of you have any thoughts on that yeah. time frame? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I believe that the, the you said just on enforcement. I think, as John said, there are very specific and uh, things that could be done to improve the way the agency works with uh, taxpayers. Uh, very much in, I'd say, in quarterly increments in the first year and two years. And some of that will have an impact on, on compliance. As far as pure enforcement, that's going to take longer. I mean, that is that is going to take a few years because some of that requires hiring people. Some of it requires some new technology that's going to take a while to and research that's going to take a while to deploy. So I think the impact on service and the indirect impact on compliance will be first. And the you know larger impact in terms of uh, let's call them traditional enforcement uh, dollars will be later. Yeah, although I think Charles is right there. When you cut the audit rate by fifty percent, some of it would be audits were not no change, but significantly. And the for large corporations, partnerships, and others, when the audit rate, even though you're not auditing everybody by a long shot, but when you're down by in some places sixty or seventy percent, simply getting back to the historic audit rate will restore immediately some significant amount of funding. But it goes back to the planning issue and the leadership issue is you need to lay all this out so that people understand, okay, this is what we can get done in the next six months, 12 months, next two years. This is what we expect to get done over three or four years. And you need to keep measuring yourself against that and reporting against it. And then I think people will be comfortable that the money was given for 10 years. It was given in a large lump sum you're not gonna spend all at once. Uh, and so they understand that uh, as long as you are making progress and as long as you're being candid about it and people can see what you're accomplishing. And then, as I said, along the way, and they can understand if they take the money away, what you're not going to accomplish and the negative impact that will have on taxpayers. Uh, so in our last few minutes, I'm, I'm wondering if any of you, if, if, if all of you rather would like to give some concluding thoughts about the plan that the agency is supposed to be developing right now, an operational plan. Uh, Secretary Yellen had directed the IRS to report back to her with some sort of operational plan by February. What would you like to see in it? What are you looking for? How much detail are, are you expecting? Um, what, what would be a good start in your review? What are sort of the, the core elements that you think need to be included? All right, I'll start and say, Numbers. I think if you produce a plan, and I love the agency and it's got a great workforce, it just produced a strategic plan that has almost no numbers in it. it. Has good goals and things that we would all support, but I think if this is going to work, you're going to have to have this is what we're going to accomplish with some specificity. Uh, whether it's raising the uh, within a couple of years the answering rate that uh, goes from 11% to 100% or 90%, and people get through on an average of five minutes rather than two or three hours, but whatever it is, and that puts you at some risk because you're out there now and said, this is what we're gonna do with the money and what we're gonna accomplish. Uh, but in the short run, at least for the next first year or two, you've got to have things out there that people can see whether you're making progress or not. Maybe you don't make all the goal, but if you get 80% there, they'll still know where you are. The longer term challenge is some of this is gonna be hard to project. Uh, so you're gonna have to say, this is where we're going over the period of time, but we're, we'll check back with you next year and the year after, we're gonna keep adding. Corporations have five-year strategic plans. They don't have 10-year strategic plans. Uh, the good plans, the first year is the budget for the next year. And usually they don't wait for five years, two or three years into it, they do another one. And I think that's really what Congress needs to understand ought to happen here is you ought to have a three to five-year immediate plan, but recognize two or three years into it, you're gonna roll all that out and rethink it and keep going forward in those increments. I, 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 I agree answer. with 
because I want you to answer last. My, advi okay. my advice is folks check out shrinkthedaxgap.com. Those words are. <laughs> and well, thanks for the commercial. A document you ought to look at the business case for IRS transformation. My only comment before we turn it over to the guy who's been on this for three years and has done this before, John has too, is set priorities, set measurable, definable goals, and report on how you do and be candid about it. It's all yours, Charles. I'm done. Of course, I, I, I agree with that, especially the commercial for shrink the tax debt. But he, here, here's, the, here's the, I think, I think, to me, the, the, the single thing that I want to leave with, because this is really important on the plan, I really hope and urge that the Congress, now that there's a nominee, will take up this um, uh, confirmation process, the hearing and, and the confirmation in this session of Congress, because the very point that you meant, Congress passed the law in August. It's already November. Okay, there needs to be a, a clear plan. And just along the lines of what John and uh, Fred said, clear priorities, metrics on what they're going to do in the first year, longer term goals, all that. The, the commissioner is the one who's going to be responsible for executing that. How can you how can you have a situation where somebody produces some kind of a plan and this commissioner comes in later on? It just that is that is very, very um Unf that would be very, very unfortunate if that happens. I think if the commissioner is confirmed during this uh, lame duck session of Congress and gets in before the end of the calendar year, that will give that person time. You know, maybe it'll have to take longer than February, but it'll give the person time to, to really put their stamp on this plan and stand behind it and be accountable for it uh, with the metrics that John was talking about for the first couple of years and the longer term goals and all of that. Um, if not, then we have an odd situation where you've got a, you know, a Congress that has passed a provided a, a bigger locomotive for the train, but they, they they don't put the engineer in the cab yet. That's not good. So I hope they will take action soon. So thanks to all of you for your very thoughtful comments and thanks to our audience for your questions. Um, really appreciate it. And I will turn it back over to Janet. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you to the commissioners for providing us with your insights and your knowledge. Um, where our second panel is going to consist of three experts who are top officials in their agencies, agencies which will have an independent role in evaluating the outcome of the $80 billion investment. Um, since March 2020, Aaron Collins has been the National Taxpayer Advocate at the Internal Revenue Service. Aaron has more than 35 years experience in the tax law, spanning 15 years in the Chief Counsel's Office at the IRS and 20 years at the accounting firm of KPMG, where she retired in 2019 as the Tax Managing Director in charge of the tax, uh, tax, controver tax controversy practice for the Western region. John McLennan is the Director of Tax Analysis at the Congressional Budget Office, where he is responsible for managing the work of CBO's Tax Analysis Division. John came to CBO in 2016, following, 20, sorry, following 18 years at the Department of Treasury's Office of Tax Analysis. At the agency, he most recently was a Special Assistant to OTA's Director, and before that, he was a Director of Revenue Estimating. Jay McTire is a Director at the Government Accountability Office um, in their Strategic Issues Team. He oversees, he joined the GAO in, 20, um, in 1991. And there for the past decade, he's been overseeing GAO's audits of the IRS on a range of issues related to tax administration and tax policy. Um, in, our last, this, in our last panel, we ended on the note of what the commissioners um, hoped for in terms of the plan. Aaron, you're on the inside. Uh, what's been going on at the IRS now uh, in terms of mobilizing to develop this plan that is due to the Secretary of Treasury in February? What's happening over there? And you're muted. All right, can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. So there's been a lot of activity um, going on within the building. 
And actually, Treasury and a number of IRS executives began having these meetings and discussions long before the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. Um, the thought process was we were hopeful that there would be additional funding, but also Treasury and IRS wanted to look forward on transformational issues. How do we improve the IRS with or without a budget, and how do we prioritize? So I'm very happy to say that uh, the legislation did pass. And so now the key focus um, has been what I would call transformational issues. So needless to say, as the NPA, my focus really is on improving tax administration, um, improving service with a focus on you know, a fair and equitable system while also protecting taxpayer rights. So um, my opinion is technology is gonna be key to improving service for taxpayers as well as practitioners. And there has been a lot of discussions. Um, there are daily meetings, uh, weekly briefings. So IRS is truly moving on trying to see how to think outside the box. And I'll kind of, I, I jokingly say, we're going from the era of the Flintstones and moving right into the Jetsons. Um, we're gonna try and skip all the basics and we're just gonna go to, you know, what is gonna be transformational in the next couple of years? Where do we see the IRS as what I would refer to as tax administration utopia. Where's the goal and, and how can we get there? Well, that's great to hear. Uh, Jay, um, part of GAO's mission is to help enhance the efficiency and the effectiveness of the federal government. Towards that end, what will you and your staff be looking for in this plan? Uh, what kind of information uh, would you find that that plan should include? How much sure. do you think? Sure, Aaron, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Oh, I can. Okay, great. Well, you know, I, I would say first, we'll be looking for a short term plan that will kind of what others have said already address immediate needs, particularly in the area of taxpayer service, the phones in person, uh, and also, you know, measures or plans actions to reduce all the processing backlogs that we've heard so much about. Uh, more specifically, GAO will be looking at steps that IRS is taking or could take to address open geo recommendations uh, you know both in the area of taxpayer service but you know more broadly as the commissioners noted service goes beyond help during the filing season to you know compliance and enforcement activities and you know as we sit here today i think there are about or nearly 200 actionable recommendations that GAO has made to the IRS that remain open. And many of those recommendations IRS fully agreed with, but the problem was that they cited a lack of resources or higher priorities uh, you know, that they had to, or that prevented them from taking the action that we recommended. Uh, and it, to sort of help out the agency, back in June, we issued a letter designating 25 of the 200 recommendations as high priority. You know, the recommendations that top leaders should be, leadership should be focused on. And just for example, eight of those, rec eight of the 25 recommendations focused on improving taxpayer service, including, um, you know, key, key basic functions in terms of improving communication with taxpayers, whether digitally or you know through, through correspondence reducing backlogs and also enhancing digital services so that's the first the more immediate uh, but secondly uh, as you know many in the the, the 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 previous panel talked about we'll be looking for a longer term vision for the future of tax administration that will address not only mission critical skills gaps in long overdue technology upgrades but also outline a vision to transform tax administration in the future. And, you know, given the funding that IRS has been provided, this is really a unique opportunity for the IRS and Treasury to really transform tax administration. Uh, you know, IRS has been quite prolific over the last decade or so in terms of putting forward different plans. You know, I think many listening today you know, we'll remember the taxpayer assistance blueprint back in the early 2000s. That kind of uh, was replaced by service on demand. And then uh, Commissioner Kostinen came in and it was the IRS future state. Uh, and, you know, just recently we had the Taxpayer First Act in 2021, which was 
an enormous effort that the IRS put forward in a really comprehensive effort in terms of the reorganization as well as a focus on uh, training and customer service. But the, as I said, the key difference I think this time around is that IRS has the funding to actually make these plans or bring these plans to fruition. And you know that said, hopefully IRS isn't going about reinventing the wheel uh, that you know that hopefully it's leveraging the ideas, the concepts, the analysis that went into all these different plans that I just mentioned. And, and that should give it a jump start. But finally, I would just say uh, years ago, uh, GAO issued some work back during the time when uh, the Department of Homeland Security was being stood up. And you know, we gathered outside experts and really focused on uh, you know, what makes a reorganization or a transformation successful. And the number one uh, um, criteria or factor that was brought up was ensuring that top leadership drives the transformation. And, you know, the discussion that we just heard about getting the commissioner confirmed quickly so that, you know, he's on board and he can really, you know, set the direction, the pace and the tone and provide clear and consistent rationale that brings all the various stakeholders, in particular, the Congress together, but also the, the employees and all the, you know, the industry stakeholders and again, you know, I'll stop here, but you know, there are a number of key leading practices that really should be focused on. And many of them were uh, brought out by the, the commissioners in the prior discussion, but that's what we're looking for. Uh, you know, we have a lot of work to do and you know, be, we'll be working closely with our clients in the oversight committees to you know, ensure proper oversight of this funding. John, um, CBO has a rather unique and important role in that the agency is responsible for estimating the revenues that were associated with the $80 billion investment. We saw over the course of the summer that the estimate changed as the legislation changed. Now, going into the coming winter, spring, you're all gonna have a chance to relook at the legislation when it comes to estimating the budget baseline. Uh, CBO releases a new estimate of the budget baseline each year. Probably that will be done after the February plan is released. What kinds of things that would be included in the plan or omitted from the plan might affect CBO's reappraisal of or confirmation of the estimate you did for the legislation? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so we're, yeah. Our bread and butter is doing the the budget projections, and so when we were, you know, having to think through that legislation as it evolved, you know, the first piece was the spending side, and there's 80 billion dollars, but it's 80 billion dollars to spend through 2031, and so the question is, how would that be be spent out, and that goes to the question of what's IRS going to do with it, um, and so I think the projections we did with the legislation throughout was guided from what we heard from the service and from Treasury, which was largely a, about the, you know, who they want to hire, the challenges to hire them, the need to invest in HR, the types of employees they wanted that also went along with the hiring authority that was in the legislation and then out of the legislation. But that's the first piece of it. And like, what is the timeline of how spending will ramp up? What does that mean for the size of the service and its activities in each year? So that's the first piece that we will um, be looking at again, um, certainly getting feedback and having a full plan would be helpful there. Um, but certainly as um, the economy evolves, that says something about um, you know, the ease of hiring. Certainly the removal of hiring authorities would make things more difficult than in the earlier version of the legislation. Um, but more importantly is what are you gonna emphasize first or, or how are you gonna balance the different things you're gonna emphasize, whether it's customer service enforcement, um, operations or, or broadly IT investment. Um, so we'll be looking at that again. Once we get that piece set, then we turn to the revenues. And, and certainly um, revenues, uh, we estimate, will be a multiple of the sort of spending, um, but the revenues follow the spending. It's not going to happen instantaneous, but it, it, again, depends on what you're going to invest in. I think we've heard um, from many quarters, but we want to hear more that maybe the additional investments will be in customer service, um, answer the phones, 
um, and do those types of things as certainly you may not want to start with enforcement and then have people not get their questions answered about you know the enforcement letter they got um, but that may have the the consequence of a lot of the revenue resulting will will follow potentially years after um, the folks are hired um, but we want to get a sense of what types of enforcement hires will you do when will you do them and again what type of activities there and i think that will relate to something that was um I, i'm sure you'll get to of like what types of audits what types of taxpayers are going to be the focus and when and so the more information we can get on that that would be uh, very helpful to us as we revisit our revenue projections so let me follow up with that as a segue to the next question but i'm going to skip to your portion of that question which is and I admit, I used to do those estimates of CEO, so I'm not trying to give away anything here, but um, back in the day, at least, CBO's estimates were largely based on changes in the enforcement budget. Um, do you or will you take into account the impact on compliance and the impact then on indirectly on revenues of increases in customer service. Yeah, so we, we've we thought hard about this, certainly as you know, the legislation's evolved over the past two years and various permutations and there were sort of different allocations um, among the different activities. We wanted to make sure we, we certainly did recognize that it isn't just the enforcement you know, account that matters. And you know, if you're gonna hire enforcement personnel, you need to make sure you have the operation support for them. You've got the physical offices for them. You have their IT support for them. Um, and then also all their activities is gonna create additional calls to the call center that those calls get answered and the information gets to all the parties within the service that needs it. Um, admittedly, it's hard to sort of think about drawing upon research and sort of really tracing how those things interact. Um, but I think we have tried to um, make sure when we've thought about it, we thought about it holistically and make sure like, where's the bottleneck? Like is, you know, the answering the phones gonna be the bottleneck? Is it like having the IT support gonna be the bottleneck or is it, you know, the front facing enforcement personnel that's gonna be the bottleneck? Um, and to that extent, I think we do recognize that investments in customer service is a necessary condition for the enforcement personnel to be as efficient and as effective as possible. Um, so I mean, it's a roundabout way to your question, but I think we are, cognizant that there is a, a thought that these things all need to work together um, and we want to make sure that um, you know that you know particularly at CBO we are constantly looking at further legislation to modify things and make sure people understand that you know cutting things from customer service or cutting things from operation support may effectively be equivalent to cutting the effectiveness of enforcement and would have similar effects to a direct cut um now again further research on understanding exactly how these things interplay would be super helpful to us um, but we are trying to um, make sure that we reflect that in any estimates that cbo does yeah i think you've summed up the complexity of the job of a revenue estimator <laughs> and then two i think you i will join you in a plea to any students out there looking for a dissertation topic to consider this issue as a topic for your dissertation uh, but talking about customer service, Aaron, in the the allocation of the funds of the eighty billion dollars, over half of it goes into the enforcement account. About forty percent of it goes into um, operation support and for uh, com and technology and modernization. Of the eighty billion over the next decade, only three billion was allocated to the account called customer service. Um, in the last session, the commissioners uh, were making the point that the borders between these accounts are not fixed. And there's some things that are that we th that they would think of as service, such as you get a letter from the IRS saying you're under audit and somebody calls and the phone is answered, that that's a form of customer service. But there are other kinds of customer services that I don't think really interact with enforcement. Do you think the three billion is sufficient to cover what you think is necessary for improvements in customer service? And you, 
Are you mute? Can we hear her? Can we hear her? Okay. Hear yes. I, I always think that service should get a larger allocation. Um, and, and similar to the former commissioners, I, I think it's how you define the word service. I'm mean, even our, our group, the Taxpayer Advocate Service, uh, a lot of people look at us as a service, but we are really the downstream consequence of enforcement where people are having a challenge and they reach out to our office for assistance. And that is falls under the bucket of service. So it really kind of depends how you define service as to whether the amounts are appropriate. Um, I do think it is a very large sum of money and thank you for that. But uh, so I think it really gets down to the IRS prioritizing what we need to do within that bucket. And, and similar to Jim was saying, you know, our office has this thing making re uh, recommendations throughout the years. Uh, a lot of them the IRS has agreed with. Um, and a lot of them are IT based and a lot of them are service based, but funding was a real problem. So I think the challenge the IRS is going to have now is taking all of the priorities um, with respect to service modernization. I'll let them figure out the enforcement piece. Um, and then trying to prioritize what absolutely has to get done and what do we need to be done quicker. Um, phones, I mean, we're all painfully aware that the phones have been a real challenge for taxpayers and practitioners. Um, and I think it's sort of a vicious cycle. Until we get the paper processed and get the correspondence done, the phones are going to continue to ring. So we've got to focus. The IRS has to put their energy on getting the paper behind them because otherwise those calls are going to continue to come in and we're just going to continue that vicious cycle. So IRS has picked up the pace on processing of the returns. Um, I think they're still not where I'd like to see them be, uh, but they have moved a lot of resources over. And so they are moving quicker than they were last year this time. So fingers crossed, we're gonna start the filing season in a better position, but I'm not as optimistic that we're gonna start, you know, basically at scratch compared to pre-COVID years. We're still gonna have a carryover uh, that they're gonna have to deal with in this upcoming filing season, which unfortunately that's technically service, getting that done. Um, so again, it's sort of a vicious cycle. We need to get that piece fixed so we can focus on where we see the future going. Where do we stand though in terms of numbers? You wrote a blog last week where it didn't look great. Yeah, so there, there's lots of numbers and, and you know that we can all slice and dice numbers differently. Um, most of us are 1040 centric. We, we really look at the 1040s. Um, as of today, I think uh, the latest reports are the unprocessed 1040s are down to 2.3 million, which is great, but we still have about 4 million of the business returns, and then we have an additional six million of returns in suspense. Um, and then we also have about two million amended returns, another couple million of 941, and then we have about another four or five million of correspondence. So when you start adding it up, the number is still larger than it needs to be as carrying over into the next fiscal year. So IRS has to continue getting those numbers down. And a lot of that has to do with paper filing, right? Um... A big challenge is the paper. Um, the issues in suspense uh, could be either paper or electronic filing. So for example, identity theft, there are about 2.7, 2.8 million returns that failed what we call a filter. The filter kicked them out as a potential fraud and the IRS needs to reach out to the taxpayer to verify is this your return or not. The challenge is because of resources, it's taking about a year to resolve those cases. And that, that's just, if you're one of those 2.8 million a year is way too long, we need to speed up that process. Jay, we face similar problems with paper filing of information returns. That information returns like W-2s and 1099s, most of them are coming in electronically, but still many are not are coming in on paper. And that's also causing issues for the IRS. Yeah, I think any paper at this point. Oh, I'm sorry, you're asking Jim. <laughs> Go ahead, Erin. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, um, Janet, we we reported on this a couple years back, and at the time it was about three and a half billion in information returns. I think it's over, you know, four billion now. And uh, at the time, we noted that about one percent was coming in on paper, and one percent sounds small, but you know, 1% of, you know, three or 4 billion is 30 or 40 million pieces of paper and, you know, plus or minus a couple million, right? So, you know, paper is, um, 
definitely, as Aaron has said, IRS is kryptonite, both on the tax return side as well on the information reporting side. And, you know, we talk about, you know, pieces of paper or, you know, these millions or billions of form, forms. What this is, is information that IRS is collecting uh, from businesses, from employers. And, you know, to the extent that IRS is not fully utilizing, getting value out of that information, you know, it, it's, <laughs> It's why people have to call. And you know, getting back to the information that comes in on paper, you know, some of that information is transcribed, uh, but errors can be introduced uh, you know, during the transcription process. So that, that will generate you know, flags and notices that go out to taxpayers. And you know, that feeds the, the backlogs and the, 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 the low level of service on phones. And so to the extent that IRS can move away from paper, not just on tax returns, but on information returns, it can improve the quality of the information. And it, you know, to the extent that it has all that information in a, an electronic or digitized format, it can then also extract more value out of that data and uh, use it, you know, for compliance purposes, but also, and I think this is very important, also reduce the burden on compliant or you know good taxpayers you know so that the IRS isn't uh, holding up their tax return or sending them notices of you know simply because IRS is not fully utilizing data or introducing mistakes once you know they have the information at IRS. I want to follow up on that because a lot of the focus on paper filing has been on how difficult it is to get the information manually inputted into the IRS master file and so forth, and the impact that it has had on refund payments and the like. But there's an enforcement angle as well, right? That not, as you've mentioned, there can be errors introduced, but is it also the case with paper filing, the paper returns and paper information returns that not all the information can be transcribed because of the work burden that required, work burden that imposes. What are the consequences then for IRS enforcement if the IRS isn't even able to use all of the information it's getting because of the because of a small, very small fraction of paper returns? Well, I would say it, it certainly has an effect on the enforcement function. To what extent it, it's hard to know. Um, you know, obviously, you know, I would say that IRS could be more effective uh, and focused in terms of where to put their enforcement dollars, whether we're talking, you know, 49 billion or, you know, their uh, 4 billion in their uh, uh, regular appropriations. So, uh, you know, that is, uh, you know, a real value of the, the information that IRS collects. It can help them be uh, just more targeted and more precise in what they're looking for. Uh, you know, one of the functions, the, the classification function, which is right now at IRS, very labor intensive. I mean, I think that's a function that could be improved tremendously by more use of electronic information uh, to highlight areas of noncompliance. Uh, why doesn't the IRS scan the paper? That's a good question. Uh, you know, we have made recommendations in that area. Uh, in the past, it has come down to uh, resource constraints. Uh, but again, now, you know, with $80 billion or 49, you know, I think that should go a long way to improving the systems, as I said, to allow it, allow IRS to capture as much information as it can that's coming in on paper, whether it's uh, OCR, optical character recognition, or uh, requiring you know, more information to be encoded on tax returns, either through uh, 2D barcoding or what uh, is now called uh, V-codes, uh, you know, vendor provided or prepared tax returns. So 
you know, I think a lot can be done with the technology and the enforcement money uh, that we're seeing, that we see under the um, Inflation Reduction Act. I guess another challenge, I mean, I see several challenges with the information returns in addition to them, in, in addition to the paper issue. One is the pure volume. I mean, it blows my mind to think that the IRS receives over 4 billion information returns a year. And that number is growing because of the, uh, the because of the requirement now on the 1099Ks, which are the forms that uh, credit card companies, PayPal send to uh, payees about transactions, that that's going down to a requirement from $20,000 a transaction to $600 a transaction. Do we have any projections of how many more information returns the IRS is going to be processing in the next uh, couple of years as a consequence? I'm going to jump in here as well. Don't forget the virtual currency. Okay. Because I think they're thinking that's going to double or more so the current 1099. So I think although the requirement that's dropping it down to the 600 will have an impact, I think the virtual currency is going to be substantially larger. So I wouldn't be surprised if you find yourself six, seven, eight, nine billion 1099s going forward. And it's not just a matter of matching. People still have to look at what comes out of the computers. So all that information is coming in. It's not just going to be sitting in computers being matched to returns. People are going to have to, someone's going to have to look at these mismatches. So we're also talking about a large number of eyes having to, you know, look at this stuff. Um, another thing yeah. I just wanted to jump in. One other um, uh, point that we made in our uh, 2018 report uh, was that a lot IRS lacks an overall strategy in terms of uh, information reporting. You know, in terms of how they want to or how they can use all the information that's coming into the agency. In 2017, they developed a, a plan to kind of modernize and oversee uh, all the information that is coming in. However, as I stated earlier, that was kind of put on hold because of first resource constraints, but also, uh, you know, other, you know, the reorganization plan under the Taxpayer First Act. But what is critical is, uh, you know, for example, in terms of managing the volume of information, there are some information returns that have dollar thresholds of a dollar or ten dollars, and we're talking, you know, ten ninety nine Bs or ten ninety nine uh, miscellaneous. And you know, IRS could manage the volume by, you know, reassessing various thresholds, and that could go a long way. And, and that wouldn't take much in, the, in terms of resources either. So I just wanted to put that out there, but it is critical that IRS look across the board. We think it's critical that they look across the board in terms of all the information that is coming in and how the agency as a whole can best utilize that information. I mean, one last challenge with the information returns. I know I'm obsessed about it because I'm writing a paper on it, but one more um, challenge is you got we're you got a lot of variation in terms of the information that's included on in information returns. So you take a W two from the taxpayer's perspective, it contains most of the information they need to put in the first line of income on their ten forty. You take um, the new ten nine the relatively new ten ninety nine k, which you know is this reporting from um, the plat the from PayPal and credit cards. And it's got information on the income, but it doesn't have information on the losses. So we've seen some studies that have demonstrated that when the IRS you know, gets this information and it's got the gross income, some taxpayers respond by overstating, essentially overstating their losses. So that keeps their net income, you know, reported net income lower than maybe might really be the case. How does, you know, going forward with this variation in terms of the amount of information that is even available, 
what does the IRS do for enforcement when all information is not equal? Um, the commission, um, Commissioner Rosati has talked about a lot of investments in technology, such as machine learning. Is that going to be a viable solution in the, at least in the short term or in the long term? Jay, I mean, have you had an opportunity to look at the return review program that um, was cited in the last set, uh, panel? Is that a guide to the future? Well, uh, we have looked at the return review program. Uh, again, I think we looked at it in 2019 or 2018. And uh, that is a very successful program uh, that the IRS implemented. It does use cutting edge information technology. And uh, it is now, I believe Aaron can correct me, but you know, the IRS's primary fraud detection system. And uh, we have recommendations to IRS that they expand uh, use of the, the program. You know, right now it is used to um, screen refunds going out, but we think it could be expanded to other types of taxpayers or uh, taxpayers who are not getting a refund, uh, but may have overstated, you know, their, or understated their tax liability. So we, we see great potential in that program. Uh, you know, definitely a success for the IRS and has really helped reduce identity theft refund fraud. Um, so did that answer your question? I think so. Aaron, do you have any concerns about the movement toward machine learning as a way of identifying returns for audits? Yeah, I, I think it has its pros and cons. Um, I think it, if it's done successfully and appropriately, uh, it could actually limit um, and, and create a better model for picking uh, cases for potential audit or enforcement. I think part of the challenge, as you brought up with the 1099-Ks, is also going to be a bit of education, because I think a lot of people will be surprised when they get a 1099-K. Um, for example, if you and I are going monthly and having lunch, and I'm always putting it on my credit card, and you're reimbursing me with, let's say, Venmo, um, you may not indicate it's personal. So all of a sudden, I get a 1099 at year end for all of our lunches. And, you know, what do I do with it? So I think there's part of this year is going to be education for taxpayers because some of those mismatches may be appropriately personal expenses versus income. So I think that's going to be a challenge. I think the whole challenge of virtual currency, I think people are not familiar how to report that. So that's going to cause all sorts of challenges with the 1099. So I do think AI, especially when you're dealing with the volume of 1099s, could be very beneficial it's just we have to make sure that we do it in a fair and partial way so that, you know, we're, we're not causing issues for taxpayers. So for the 80 billion for enforcement, um, the administration has really targeted three groups for audits. The first one I call the $400,000 question is that um, it was in the legislation, it's out of the legislation, it's definitely in Secretary Yellen's directive to the IRS that the additional funds shall not be used to increase audit rates above recent or above historic levels for taxpayers with income below 400,000. Uh, John, I expect that you may be, this may be a question that you receive in some way or another from your bosses on the Hill. Yeah, um, we dealt with that $400,000 question a number of times. Um, so, you know, we had to wrestle with what that meant um, and we sort of had to deal with it sort of in the real time of the bill getting uh, debated in the Senate. And the way we thought about that is going back to this question of, um, you know, what types of activities is the IRS going to undertake? What type of people do they need to hire to do them? Um, and we thought that the 400,000, you know, actually had real meaning. It's an arbitrary line in some sense, but it, but nevertheless, um, you know, there are a lot of activities of auditing taxpayers who have relatively more straightforward returns that maybe they, you know, didn't include everything or just technically aren't as complicated. A lot of those taxpayers may be below $400,000. 
taxpayers above $400,000 are probably more likely to have more sophisticated financial planning. Um, certainly business returns often are more complicated. You need to hire a different type of IRS employee to engage in a lot of those audits. And so the $400,000 question intersects with like, what type of people are you going to try to hire and what's your good of success in hiring them? And so we had that as a um, mattering, um, but particularly mattering in the short run of like, you need to have a more developed hiring strategy. You're gonna need more training to get people up to speed to do the more sophisticated audits. And if that is what you're gonna focus on with the additional resources for the IRS, um, that was gonna sort of alter the revenue that came in. Although a lot of that may be deferring when revenue comes in as opposed to changing the level, but we did think that it would slow the hiring process, slow the period of time before those employees were effective if you were gonna sort of push most of your resources to um, away from you know, individual taxpayers with, with incomes below $400,000. Jay, I can imagine someone asking GAO to do a report <laughs> that will look at, did they meet that goal? And, you know, we've got funding for regular appropriations, which can be used for any kind of audit. And then we've got the, the, the 80 billion with the $400,000 threshold. How are you gonna do a study, as I'm sure you're gonna be asked to do, that looks at this question of, did the, did the administration, did the Treasury Department, IRS keep its promise uh, not to audit those, not to use the additional funds to audit people with less than $400,000? So, so Jay, before you answer, uh, let me just like point out, when members of Congress said, but hold it, the secretary's you know, letter is not the same thing as law, I provided assurances that I am sure GAO would be happy to write such a study and it would be very effective in highlighting the issues that the IRS has to confront. So, so with so my I, vote of confidence, Jay, I'll, I'll now pass the mic You may have already received that letter. So John <laughs> McLennan has directed us to call you. All right. Uh, yeah, and, and I think my I audio think just went out, but anyway, go ahead, Aaron. I was gonna say, I wanna jump in as well. My, my concern and, you know, uh, smarter people uh, and higher ups can make the decision which way the IRS Treasury wants to go up 400,000. And I think the reason they picked the 400 is about 98% of the people fall 400,000 and below. But my concern is how this is being portrayed in the press and the message that's going out to practitioners and individuals, which is IRS is not auditing under 400,000. Um, I think there's, they're, they're not looking at the fine print of with the additional funding. So I am concerned that a lot of times when I publicly speak, I hear people say, you know, practitioners, well, the IRS isn't going to audit anyone under 400,000. So, you know, again, I just, it's messaging. And I think we just have to make sure that, because I think for voluntary compliance, if people believe you're not going to be audited, um, I do think that's going to have a negative impact on voluntary compliance. So, you know, again, we can get into technical discussion of which funds are used for what purpose. I think we just have to be careful that the general message going out to taxpayers and practitioners are, you know, it's going to be a normal audit, however you want to define that. And then the additional funds we're going to focus on either the high net worth or flow through entities or, you know, whatever is going to be. But I am concerned because I am hearing it. And when you read articles in the press, kind of, and the additional funds kind of falls down three sentences later. So, um, and again, I think we just have to make sure that message goes out to taxpayers. I mean, related to that is the language of, not above recent or historical levels that it opens the possibility that audits will actually increase for people under 400 relative back to some level in the past without a specification of what that level means. Jay, do you want to say anything since we well, kept... You know, uh, Janet, you raised a very good point. I mean, you know, relative to what overall audit rates are down by about... Uh, they're, they're at about a third of what they used to be uh, 10 years ago, uh, just across the board. They've fallen more for higher income individuals, high income, high wealth individuals. And, you know, when we talk about 400,000 of income, is that, you know, we could get very technical. Is that adjusted gross income? Is that net positive income? Uh, and uh, John and Janet, you know this well, you know, 
all money is green. So unless IRS uh, tracks this yeah. new funding very carefully with some sort of uh, accounting code, it will be near impossible to tease out, you know, which dollars went where. And IRS in its base budget has a lot of flexibility to move money around, uh, you know, user fees, they collect in a, like at least a half a billion annually in user fees that often go where there's the greatest need for additional resources. And so I think it will be very difficult to track to any uh, great accuracy or extent, you know, just, you know, what money is going toward, you know, what type of audits, but, uh, you know, we'll certainly be watching very carefully. So another of the targets is partnerships. And John, you were a co-author of what is considered to be, in my area, a well-known paper that looked at, they addressed the question of who owns U.S. businesses and how much taxes do they pay. What lessons from that paper, what lessons are there from that paper for what it's going to mean for trying to increase enforcement on partners and partnerships? Yeah, I, I have great appreciation for the challenges that that they face in the field on these. And so like the, the project that Janet alludes to um, is really was an attempt to sort of take all the administrative records that were provided to the IRS and to trace from the sort of business that was undertaking the activity all the way through to the tax, the individual taxpayer for a partnership that would eventually pay tax um, on that related to that activity. And um, it, it was daunting in the sense that how many times um, one partnership would be sort of reporting income to another partnership, to another partnership, to another partnership. And, and as a result, that it became extraordinarily hard to have this linkage to make sure that there was complete and consistent reporting of all the economic activities. And traditionally, when the service has looked at sort of a lot of these pass-through businesses, it's like they first audit the partner. And then they take that return and say, there's activity here. Let me then go back and look at the partnership. But it's not just one step. It's going to be multiple steps up. And um, I think that makes it, um, you know, I think IRS is going to really have to think hard about how to sort of crack that nut in a way that's both manageable um, and doesn't, you know, make sure that you're sort of looking in the right places so that, you know, you don't have a lot of no change audits. Um, it's, it's like, I think no one wants a no change audit, but when you sort of just fall into the fog of one partnership, one tiered partnership after another tiered partnership, it's easy to see how you sort of could throw up your hands and be like, I'm throwing, you know, good time, uh, additional hours into this audit. Am I ever going to see the bottom? Maybe I should walk away. That's a no change audit. Um, and so um, I think it's, it's very, very challenging there. Part of that's just a function of the way the law works. Um, certainly additional information returns and sort of more sophisticated processing of those information returns um, will help, um, but it, it is, will not be easy. And I think it will take a fair amount of additional research and a little bit of trial and error so you can develop a strategy that you think is effective and efficient, um, just given the complexity and increasing complexity um, in, in that area uh, of the return filing population. Trial and error is hard because that means that in the short term, some compliant taxpayers are going to get caught in the burden of an audit. Yep. And that's not going to make this investment any more popular. Yeah, and, and that goes back to like a long run plan. And, and I think the commissioner talked to about this in the earlier panel of, you know, being clear about what the plan is and hoping you sort of buy yourself enough time to, to implement the plan. Uh, but if you're putting all your eggs in the basket of like the first thing out of the gate we're going to do is to solve um, the partnership problem, um, I, I, <laughs> I, 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 would, I would fear for if that is that your strategy. But nevertheless, it's, um, you know, no one, you know, I think back to you know, Aaron's point there about you know, no one getting a pass and people thinking that you know, voluntary compliance is important here and that people will do their best. Um, that's true for people below 40,000, but it's also true for partnerships that, you know, there should be audit attention here. Um, and so I think IRS being clear about how they're going to use those information returns in an effective way um, has great potential, um, but it will be challenging. So the IRS, you know, we talk in economics, maybe other fields, of both necessary and sufficient conditions. 
So the money was necessary, but is it sufficient? Is there other things that the IRS needs that money can't buy, but that they need in order to use the $80 billion effectively? Okay, I will throw out. <laughs> well, I, I can say I, something on that uh, one. Uh, All right, uh, well, I'll go back to first <laughs> principles of, of, you know, you know, certainly the IRS is not, you know, creating tax policy. Um, you know, they are taking the policies that's there. And so they have the task of trying to apply the law as written in, you know, a fair and effective manner. Um, certainly that, you know, and the pandemic has shown, the IRS has been asked to do a lot of things and they've had to use, you know, their existing resources and the tools they have to do that. Um, certainly IRS's life would be simpler uh, with a simpler tax code and more transparent rules and clear guidance for taxpayers about what their obligations are. Um, because there's certainly a lot of the issues the IRS confronts is just a, a lack of clarity. Um, it may not be nefarious intent. So uh, again, I don't think it's IRS's position to call for that. Certainly not my position to call for that, but just an observation of there is an interplay between the complexity of the tax system that IRS is asked to administer and the resources it has available to do so. Are there changes to IRS's authority, how they do audits, that would help facilitate, you know, more effective use of the eighty billion dollars? Um, other statutory changes. You know, GAO has a number of uh, recommendations to Congress that would simplify, uh, you know, both. Uh, the burden on taxpayers, as well as improve compliance and enforcement. Uh, we have, we as well as others have long advocated for uh, IRS to have the authority to set standards for uh, paid tax preparers uh, that would help protect, you know, lo lower income uh, filers, as well as, uh, you know, pr protect them from mistakes and the burden of an IRS audit. We've called for expanded uh, math error authority or a correctable authority where IRS, you know, we talk about all the data that IRS has on hand and, you know, what other government agencies may have. And so, you know, we think IRS, you know, with, with, it, with safety valves around that uh, could better utilize that information if given the authority to, you know, correct a tax return and you know say you know then send a notice to the taxpayers saying hey you know these numbers didn't match can you you know, it, you know what what's going on here uh in other words taking that first step um as opposed to sending out a notice and then the taxpayer has to respond so it would cut down on some of the burden uh, but would still protect taxpayers and you know there are a number of other areas where it has matters outstanding that we think could help uh as i said help tax administration. And, and you know, GIO is all for uh, clarification, you know, more clarity in the tax code. That's, you know, where IRS, you know, where the Congress has put a huge burden on the IRS. And, uh, you know, that is, that has created situations in the past where, you know, IRS has gotten in trouble, if you will. Um, you know, in terms of its interpretation uh, of the tax law. I want to turn for the, perhaps the last question of the day, but this is the question that you all are in a unique position to answer, which is what are the metrics for determining whether this is a success? And in each of your roles, you're going to be looking at aspects. What kinds of I hate to use the term performance measures because that implies something quantitative and it's not necessarily a quantitative metric that's necessary. But what will you all be looking at in terms of judging whether the IRS has used the $80 billion effectively? A change in the tax gap? John's looks on his face are telling a story that maybe no words are necessary. <laughs> Aaron, I think you're on mute. Mute? Yeah. Sorry about that. All right. 
Um, I, I think it's a really challenging question because, again, I think from our perspective, we really are looking more on the service side, which are simple things such as answering a telephone. Uh, a large percentage of audits on lower income folks come out of the automated under reporting unit or correspondence audits. We need to clean those up. We need to have uh, more guidance, simple, simple notices in English or whatever language it is, but, you know, terms that people can understand. I mean, a lot of what we're focusing on are the folks that are under the 400,000 mark, because that is the substantial amount of taxpayers that we deal with. So really, it's the day-to-day -day dealings with the IRS. How is that improved, and where do they go forward? Um, I'm, I'm going to leave the partnership and the high end, because uh, those changes are not going to take place tomorrow on the enforcement, but I am very hopeful that the service and modernization piece can get done in the next 12 to 36 months. I think a lot of people are going to be looking at two parameters in particular. They are going to be looking at the tax gap and they are going to be looking at the audit rates. And are those, what is it that those measures are going to tell us? And are they going to tell us enough to know whether, are they going to tell us something? Are they going to be misleading? Are they going to really be sufficient to explain how the 80 billion was used? I'll start. I mean, you know, I think the tax gap could provide a kind of a motivational goal. Uh, the problem with the tax gap it is, is that it's so broad and measurement is, you know, very difficult and it's not timely. Uh, even in the, even with the 10 year horizon that we're talking about with the Inflation Reduction Act, I mean, it will barely get, you know, one, one tax gap estimate in that 10 year framework that would reflect what was going on since the infusion of the money of, you know, so I do think we have more outcome or, or, or output focused measures such as level of service, uh, wait times uh, on the customer service side. I think we can look at audit rates on the enforcement side, no change rates. I think those are pretty good metrics uh, to guide us. Uh, you know, for the broader effort, as the commissioners talked about, I think it's, you know, key that it, leadership is, you know, very transparent about, you know, what the agency hopes to accomplish, uh, you know, what it is accomplishing, you know, quarterly or yearly, uh, and how that measures up against, you know, what they set forth at the beginning. So a lot of transparency, I think, is key. And, you know, talking about specific actions uh, and, and throw in those metrics that I mentioned, I think would help. Uh, John, what should we be looking at the return on investment? Well, that's what I was going to say. I, I think that, you know, having a, a particular detailed plan of like, here are the activities we decided to expand with the additional resources. And then for those activities, um, you know, a sense of, you know, what are the activities with those resources you undertook? You know, how many audits did you start? What types of audits? And then the, the questions that come out of that or the measures that come out of that. What was the no change rate? What is the return on investment? That is, how much of direct enforcement revenues did you receive from those activities? And I think that will be instructive because, you know, some things the IRS, will, they're going to do a lot of, it'll do a lot of things with these additional resources. Some things will end up being more effective on the, than others, but if they've been clear about what they're doing and give us that commentary as they go along, I think that will contribute to confidence that they are attempting to learn from their activities and they are improving. Um, but that will mean that they will need to be clear about here is our plan, here are the things we undertook, and then be committed to sort of consistently providing that feedback, um, which will mean in some cases they'll say that didn't work as well as perhaps we hoped, but maybe they will uncover things that turn out to be extraordinarily effective um, and targeted, and, and that would be fabulous. Um, and it probably install a lot of confidence that the service is on the right track. And I'll just end with my own plug on this subject, which is we're going to need a lot of metrics. And there also will have to be a recognition that no, many metrics will not be perfect. The tax gap, for example, improvements in identifying noncompliance will spill over into the studies of the tax gap. And so all other things equal, you may see an increase in noncompliance just because the IRS 
has become better at detecting it. So broad minds, broad metrics, lots of them. And on that note, having gotten the last word <laughs> on my favorite subject, uh, I want to thank the panelists, John, Aaron, Jay, for participating. And I'd like to thank the audience for um, paying attention, staying here for most of the, you know, for the two hours. So thank you. And um, the event people would want to remind you, want me to remind you to please take a moment to fill out the event survey. And there's a link in the chat. So thank you very much. And this is a conversation that I expect will continue for some time. Bye. Thank you.